Okay, let's begin talking about the sky. So when you look up in the sky, what do you see? Well, obviously you see the sun during the day. Uh, you see the stars at night. And of course you also see the moon. Um, all the motions that uh, create uh, the kind of rising and setting and um, the sun at different heights, all that is controlled by the earth and its orbit. So when we talk about the sky, uh, it's important to then kind of touch on the stars and how they move, the earth, the sun, and the moon. And so that's what we're going to look at as we go through and talk about the sky. So here we go. First off, when you look up in the sky any, any given night and any given location on earth uh, at any time, given time of year, you're going to see different stars. But what you're going to see is actually just a very small part of our own galaxy alone, let alone the universe. Um, now, this is not the Milky Way galaxy, but this is what we look think the Milky Way galaxy looks like. Uh, we're in the Milky Way, so we can't see, see it. Uh, but uh, we think it is a spiral or a barred spiral galaxy. And the portion of the Milky Way that we're able to see is just this small part, let alone the entire rest of the universe. Uh, so when you look up at night, that's what you see. Uh, of course, with telescopes, we can see much further, uh, but this is with the naked eye. All right, so uh, one of the things you're going to see is that actually stars move. I don't know if you realize that or, if, or kind of you know thought about that before, but when you look up in the sky and you, for example, look at a star that's above a tree, you'll actually, if you watch it for like 15 minutes, a half hour, you'll see the star move. And the stars actually do rise in the east and set in the west, just like uh, the sun. Um, and they actually uh, rise and set because of the Earth's rotation. And uh, there is one star that's directly above the North Pole, directly above the Earth's rotational axis, and that is Polaris, the North Star. And so it actually looks like if you do a time-lapse time -lapse view of the stars, they do rise in the east and set in the west. But if you look north, it looks like all the stars are, are rotating around Polaris, uh, which is pretty interesting. Now, uh, you can see Polaris here. It's actually just a medium bright star. It's not the brightest star in the sky. It's not uh, anything special per se, except that it is the center of all motion for the stars because it's right above the North Pole. That's why they call it the North Star. And so if you walk towards Polaris, you're actually walking due north. Um, interestingly enough, um, if you look at the Big Dipper, and the Big Dipper here in the Northern Hemisphere is always visible uh, because it's in the Northern Celestial Sphere and we're in the Northern Hemisphere of the Earth. So we'll always see it at night. Uh, and depending on where the Big Dipper is, it doesn't matter. These two little end stars actually point towards Polaris. Uh, so it doesn't matter what season you're in, uh, we'll always see the Big Dipper at night. And the Big Dipper, the stars are bright enough that we can see them. They always point to Polaris. Polaris is real dim in our sky, but you, you can see it, you can make it out. Uh, so if it's if if it's not cloudy and you can see the Big Dipper, you can see Polaris, and you know what direction you're going at night. Another thing we notice is that stars twinkle. Uh, why do stars twinkle? Scientists call this scintillation. Stars twinkle because the starlight from stars appears just as a point to our eyes. Stars are just really, really tiny because they're so very far away, and so the light that comes in is very powerful. But nonetheless, it just appears to our eyes as a point. And so as the starlight comes in at that point source of light, it actually passes through airs of different densities and temperatures. And the differing densities of air, based on the temperature, the water vapor, uh, et cetera, it actually gets refracted as it uh, continues to move through uh, the atmosphere. And so the the changing speed and direction of starlight as it moves through the atmosphere causes this uh, twinkling effect. And you can kind of see it illustrated in the uh, GIF on the bottom of the slide here, uh, how this works. Now, planets are actually a different story. Planets actually do not twinkle. Uh, they do not dance around or shimmer. And this is because uh, planets are close enough that our eyes picks them up as a disc. And so the disc of light that uh, as the beam of light from the disk comes through our atmosphere, we actually, uh, it corrects for all the motions this way and that of the light. Uh, and so the planets don't twinkle. Uh, 
So if you ever see a bright object in the sky and you stare at it for a little bit, if it's not uh, shimmering around, dancing, dancing, if it's not twinkling, it's probably a planet. The planets that are very visible from Earth here are um, Mercury and Venus, uh, and those usually appear just before uh, dawn or just after dusk because they stay close to the sun because they're between us and the sun. And then we see also then Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, uh, typically in our sky. And those are the main planets that we're able to see. And of course, when we look up at the stars, we notice patterns. Uh, those patterns, of course, we call constellations. Now, early civilizations created these constellations to help study and use the stars. It's more easy to study them if you can recognize the patterns in the sky. You can kind of get your bearings on what's what up there a little bit better. An uh, example of constellation here is Orion. You see uh, Orion the hunter pictured here. The, the upper right shoulder of Orion is called Betelgeuse. Uh, it's a, a red supergiant star. And here's the other shoulder. Here's the kind of head of Orion, his belt and his uh, sheath for his sword up here and his two, his uh, left knee and right knee here. And then um, in front of him, there's a bow not pictured here uh, and then a sword raised up above his head. Uh, but Orion is a com common constellation we see in the fall and winter, winter periods uh, that we see it during our, our time in the sky. All right. Um, it, as it turns out, uh, when you look up in the sky, you see some prominent constellations, right? What um, a bunch of scientists did is they got together and, first of all, they made this International Astronomical Union, which is like a, uh, a board of scientists that uh, make decisions about uh, the field of astronomy and all things uh, astronomy. And they got together and convened in 1930, and they decided, okay, so we've got all these, these prominent constellations. What we're going to do is draw boundaries around them. and uh, every star that's a part of the, the shape of that constellation, plus all the stars that are within the boundary we draw around it, are part of that constellation. And so it made things even easier to study uh, from a scientific perspective, because even if a star is not part of the shape of something, as long as it's near it, it's part of that constellation. And so they actually name stars based on their brightness in the constellation. So Alpha Orion, Beta Orion, Alpha Orion would be the star Betelgeuse I pointed out earlier, uh, it is the brightest star in the constellation of Orion. These Greek letters and then the name of the constellation and name the stars. After that, they use numbers. Uh, but here's a picture of the night sky. Uh, it's hard, of course, to uh, put the spherical night sky on a flat um, piece of paper, which so it's distorted in the north and the south here. Uh, but you can see all the different boundaries that are drawn around the, the different constellations out there. So there are 88 official constellations. There are also smaller parts of bigger constellations uh, that make shapes. We call those asterisms. Uh, the Big Dipper is the prominent example. The Big Dipper is actually not a constellation. The Big Dipper is an asterism. Um, it is part of the larger constellation, Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And you can see Ursa Major here. Uh, this is the back of the Big Dipper. The pan of the Big Dipper makes the back of Ursa Major. And it comes up to the point of the head. And then you got the arms and the claws dangling down here. And then the tail, of course, this bear has a tail. Uh, <laughs> the Ursa Major bear has a tail. Uh, but that tail is the, is the handle of the Big Dipper. So the Big Dipper is an asterism. It's not a constellation. Also, if you follow the two end stars of the Big Dipper again, they come down here and kind of curve down to point to Polaris, the North Star. And so that's the center of all rotation. And Polaris is actually the end of the, of the handle that makes the, the, the Little Dipper. And that's also known as Ursa Minor, the little bear. Uh, but the little dipper here has a kind of an, a backwards curved uh, handle with a ladle. Um, what's interesting is we've been talking about the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper looks like the Big Dipper to us in, uh, in our sky, but in actuality, the stars are at different distances away from one another in the sky. Uh, so for example, the closest star, the Big Dipper, is uh, 63 light years uh, right here, the part of the pan that connects to the, to the uh, handle. Uh, there are other stars, like the end of the handle, that's 210 light years from Earth, so way, way further. <clears throat> 
So the apparent shape of the Big Dipper in our sky actually has stars at differing distances. So it's very interesting. Another little fun fact is that the Big Dipper will not always look like the Big Dipper. Eventually, these stars will move. Stars are moving, but because they're so far away, we don't really detect the movement uh, away from one another um, during our lifetime. But um, if you go through many generations, you know, thousands, ten thousands, tens of thousands of years, you start to see the stars in different positions in the sky. So in millions of years from now, the Big Dipper will not look as it does because these stars are moving. There is one special band of uh, stars we call the Zodiac. The Zodiac constellations are the ones that actually follow the path of the sun in our sky. Now, of course, the Earth orbits the sun. Okay, so the Earth would be doing this around the sun. But when you take a look at the Earth, uh, from the Earth, you can see where the sun is. And whatever the sun, whatever constellation the sun is, that's uh, at noontime, that is the Zodiac constellation for that month. Uh, so very interesting. So when the Earth swings around to this point, I'll get out my uh, stylus here. When the Earth swings around to this point in its orbit, and the Earth is pictured here, um, we would have the constellation of Aquarius in the noon sky. So that would be the zodiac sign for, for that particular time of year. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, but this is how the, the Babylonians... Uh, uh, created the zodiac so that it could help keep time with the sun. So that's the significance of the zodiac. They're the 12 constellations that lie within the path of the sun in our sky. Okay, so the stars, as I mentioned before, rise in the east and set in the west because of the Earth's rotation. In fact, if you think about the Earth like a uh, um, someone with a camera, like a camera person, uh, Wherever we are at on Earth is our location. Um, that's kind of like the camera. And as the Earth rotates, uh, the camera and the camera person just do the rotation. And they, the, the, the things that they see in front of them are uh, usually the sun, of course, during the day. And the sun's light comes into the Earth and bleaches everything out so we can't see all the rest of the stars. But they're there. Uh, and then when the, the, the Earth camera pans around to the nighttime, you can see that all the nighttime stars. So uh, this diagram kind of shows this in September when when our, our locality is pointed toward the sun, of course, our sky is washed out with blue, right? But when we uh, rotate around to this point and the, when we look out at the sky here, these are the constellations that we see over the course of the night. And then when the Earth gets back here again and points this way, our sky is starting to get washed out by the sun's light again, and we just see, we don't see any more of these stars. So all these stars over here, we won't see them. We won't see these. We won't see these. We won't see these in September. We won't see these, but we will see these stars uh, basically right here. These are the stars we'll see during the month of September. Uh, of course, as the Earth traverses around the sun, uh, that motion is called revolution. If you think about a revolution as like a sweeping change, uh, as the Earth revolves, it's doing a sweeping change around uh, the sun. And so the Earth revolves. And as it revolves, and it gets to get to January now, uh, all the stars that are out here, we can't, we're not going to be able to see because of the sun's light bleaching out our sky. The stars that we do see during January are these ones right here. Uh, when, the, when our sky ends, uh, when the stars are not washed out, we can actually see all of these stars over the course of the night in January. The same uh, situation goes for May. So we see different stars at different times of the year, and this is thanks to Earth's rotation. Or sorry, Earth's revolution, sorry. So this is revolution, sweeping change, and rotation is what ice skaters do. Okay, uh, they spin in place, that's rotation. All right, so just to keep those straight there. Let's talk about Earth and its motions. Uh, the Earth completes one spin in just over 20, uh, just under 24 hours. Um, in order to get the sun lined back up, it takes right about 24 hours. Uh, and so that's why our day is 24 hours. Our day is based on our, the position of the sun in our sky. And rotation is that spin. Uh, the Earth's axis of rotation is tilted by about 23 and a half degrees. Uh, so the Earth's tilt is 23 and a half degrees. Uh, that's why we have the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. That's when the sun is directly overhead in those locations on Earth. And the sun's location, uh, directness, um, 
direct location changes over the course of the year as the tilted Earth revolves around the sun. Uh, the fancy word for tilt is obliquity. Uh, one other point about that is I want to say that the Earth's tilt is actually changes on a cycle. You can see the cycles from like 600,000 years to the present here uh, that the Earth has uh, changed uh, its tilt from uh, less tilted to more tilted over time. And it's got uh, it does this, does so in cycles. It goes anywhere from 22.1 to 24.5 in its tilt. The Earth also wobbles as it rotates. Um, so it's tilted, and as it rotates, because of the liquid interior of the Earth, it actually has a wobble. And the precession or wobble of the Earth actually takes um, 26,000 years to complete one wobble. Right now, the Earth is tilted towards Polaris here. Uh, but as it wobbles, uh, it will eventually, um, you, can, you can see the wobble here, the Earth uh, will wobble this way over the course of 13,000 years, and in 13,000 years, our North, our North Star is going to be Vega. So the precession of the Earth, the wobble of the Earth, because of its internal liquidity, uh, has it um, kind of rotating around like a top would as it spins, and it changes the North Star position, and therefore changes our view of the stars uh, during the seasons. So pretty interesting. Uh, a little bit more about the Earth's revolution. The Earth revolves around the sun. Um, of course, it takes about 365.25 days or so, to two, four days, I guess, to uh, revolve around the sun. Um, there, the Earth's orbit is elliptical. We know that thanks to uh, the observations of Tycho Brahe and the analysis of Johannes Kepler. And we talked about these terms, perihelion. Perihelion is the point where the Earth is closest to the sun, and that is actually on January 3rd. Um, so just after the, the winter solstice on January 3rd, the Earth hits perihelion, and it's at 147 million kilometers at that point in its journey around the sun. Um, we talked about Kepler's second law that the actually the, um, the the Earth moves faster in its orbit at this point because it's closer to the Sun. It's being kind of gravitationally slingshotted around the Sun at this point. The Earth also goes through a perihelion, or sorry, an aphelion, and the aphelion is the term we use to describe when it's farthest from the Sun, and that's when it's 152 million kilometers, and that occurs on July 4th. All right. Uh, so uh, this is just after the summer solstice, and this is when the Earth is farthest. And again, we talked about how the Earth moves slowest at this point, uh, but that's perihelion and aphelion. Now, I do want to make note here. Um, notice this date, July 4th. This is when the Earth is farthest from the sun. So why is it so cold or why is it so warm on July, in July 4th, if this is the uh, when the Earth is farthest from the sun at 6 million kilometers further from the sun than at perihelion. So what's the deal there? Why does the Earth have seasons then? Why are our summer seasons so warm? Let's talk about that. What is the reason for the seasons? Well, primarily it's the directness of sunlight. The key word for seasons is directness of sunlight here. Uh, the directness of sunlight changes over the course of the year because the Earth is curved, it's tilted, and it revolves around the sun. The most important aspect of seasons here is tilt, but you can't get seasons without the Earth being a sphere and without the Earth revolving around the sun. Ultimately, what the tilt does with the curved Earth revolving around the sun is it changes the directness of sunlight. So if you've got a one-word answer of why the Earth has seasons, the directness of sunlight changes over the course of the year. Directness of sunlight changes. And why does it do that? Because the Earth is tilted. It's curved and it revolves around the sun. So in the picture I have here, I have the uh, most direct rays here in the southern hemisphere on the tilted Earth. This would make, uh, this is what happens in wintertime. When we're up here in Geneva, okay, uh, this is when we have the coldest weather, and that's because we're getting glancing blows from the sun's rays. The sun's rays are really, the sun's energy is really spread out over a large area. In this uh, case, uh, where the sun is more direct, the sun's light is more concentrated. The same amount of sunlight is spread out over a larger area here on the Earth's surface in the wintertime for us. 
So the directness of sunlight changes over the course of the year. And notice how the Earth is tilted uh, during winter time, where the most direct rays are in the south, versus the summertime here, when the most direct rays are on the north. Okay, so the directness of sunlight gives us, when you get more direct sunlight, you get more heat, and therefore the seasons are warmer. So the distance from the Earth to the sun actually does not matter as much as the directness of sunlight that we get. So I'm going to say that again. We're warmest when the sun is most direct, not when we're closer or further to the sun. So seasons is about directness of sunlight. Now, the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees, so it has seasons. Mars tilted 25 degrees, so does Mars have seasons? Yeah. Yes, they do. In fact, the greater the tilt, the more extreme the season. So Mars with its 25 degree tilt would experience more uh, intense seasons. Uh, one other thought here, um, does, and all the different planets have different tilts, right? Uranus has a uh, 90 or 89 degree tilt. Actually, it's 98 degrees, but it would be, you know, flip the opposite way. So Uranus has a 98 degree tilt. Does Uranus have seasons? Well, again, the greater the tilt, the more extreme seasons. So the answer is yes, Uranus has seasons and Uranus has extreme seasons. So um, the seasons would be like, you know, one part of the year, uh, the northern hemisphere would not receive any sun at all. And uh, if you go a half a year later on Uranus, it would be the sun uh, full blown all day and night on, on the planet. So uh, kind of crazy there, right? The more extreme the tilt, the more extreme the seasons. All right, a little bit uh, more about seasons to kind of tie it up here. Um, of course, when the sun is most direct here in the northern hemisphere, that would be the summer solstice. Okay, the most direct rays are on the Tropic of uh, uh, Cancer at that point. Uh, that's 23.5 23 degrees north latitude. So that's the Tropic of Cancer. It's labeled up here, the Tropic of Cancer, by the way. Um, that's where the Earth's most direct rays are in the summer. And this is uh, June 21st, usually anywhere kind of like plus or minus June 21st to June 22nd, depending on um, how it all falls out for that particular time of year. Um, this is when Earth's tilt uh, is having the northern hemisphere tilted towards the sun. This is the longest day of the year because, because we're tilted so far towards the sun, uh, the sun stays in our sky longer. Notice the, uh, the, the brightness of the sun here. Um, it'll stay in the northern hemisphere sky longer. Uh, conversely, uh, the winter solstice is when the sun's most direct rays are on the Tropic of Capricorn down here. And again, the Tropic of Capricorn is labeled uh, right up here, um, 23.5 degrees south. Again, the Earth's tilt is 23.5 degrees. So um, the, the winter solstice uh, is between December 21st, 22nd. It's when the North Pole is tilted farthest away from the sun. So down here, I've got a little picture showing the path of the sun in, the, in our sky on December 22nd here. Uh, the sun takes a very short path. It rises in the east, comes up to the highest point, and sets in the west. And it's only up for about um, eight hours or so, or nine hours. Uh, in the case of the winter or the summer solstice, the sun, because we're so it's so far north in our sky, it, stay, it rises for eight hours and sets for eight hours for a total of about 16 hours in our sky. Uh, so uh, pretty, pretty vastly different in the, because of the Earth's tilt. And then, um, of course, we know that we have autumn and spring, right? The, the um, time when the sun is directly on the equator, this is when it's either spring or fall, right? Uh, the vernal equinox is when uh, the sun's most direct rays are on the equator and the sun is headed northward. And the autumnal, and that's really pictured here, March 20th. 21st. And then the vernal equinox, or sorry, the autumnal equinox is when the sun's most direct rays are on the equator and it's headed southward. And that would be um, September 22nd to September 23rd. All right. And that marks the start of fall. So um, that's how all, it all works with the seasons. The, si the sun rises in the northeast in the summer and in the southeast in the winter then. Um, that's what we saw in that um, 
two slides ago, but this is uh, where you would see um, due east here. This is where the sun would rise when it's at those equinoxes. It would rise in the northeast here uh, during the summer solstice, and it would rise in the north and the southeast, excuse me, the southeast in uh, the winter solstice. Okay. So that's a little bit about motions of the sun in our sky. Um, one uh, couple, one last couple last points, I guess, is that the sun uh, actually rises and sets because of Earth's rotation as well. Um, as the Earth rotates around this way, okay. Let me get let me get a red so you can see here. As the Earth rotates around this way over the course of the day. Okay, uh, the sun will get higher and higher in the sky and then eventually set. So the folks over here in California will rotate this way and get get to a point where the sun is there directly overhead. That's called um, noon, local noon, right? And so the solar time is timed by the sun. Okay, wherever our local sky is uh, and wherever the sun is relative to our local sky, that's our solar time. Because the sun is at overhead, directly overhead at different times of the day, we have to have time zones. This, when the sun is directly overhead in Chicago here, okay, um, it's not going to be overhead and, and it's just going to be still rising over here in California. Uh, so we need to have noon or 12 o'clock noon be when the sun is kind of directly, mostly directly overhead in our area. That's our central time zone. And uh, as the earth rotates this way, uh, California eventually will have the sun directly overhead, uh, but it's going to be up several, a few hours later. So they have the Pacific um, time zone. And so what they did is, a bunch, again, a bunch of scientists got together and said, hey, we need to make time zones to make things uh, right. So what they did was they uh, created about uh, one time zone for every 15 degrees of longitude. Um, and um, as a result, uh, there's many time zones that occur all the way around the world. Um, of course, right now we have daylight savings time, but I think they're th talking about doing away with that um, uh, because it's we're finding it's not as necessary as it should be. Uh, there's actually a statistic that there are more heart attacks uh, when the clocks spring ahead, when you lose an hour of sleep in the springtime, uh, there are more heart attacks than any other time of year, which is crazy, but it's because people get less sleep, uh, believe it or not. So um, very interesting there. All right, and here are the world time zones. Noting that our time zone here is in purple. This is the central uh, central time zone. Uh, but as you go um, eastward, you go an hour ahead. And if you go westward, you go an hour behind. They add to th If you keep going westward, you just keep going back in time. So they had to add this international dateline thing so that when you pass over it, you, you subtract or you add a day. Otherwise, you just keep going back in time. Uh, so they threw in that international dateline thing. So, all right, well, folks, that was uh, a little bit about the motions of the stars in our sky and, and a little bit about the stars, uh, the motions of our Earth with rotation and revolution and all that business, and the motions of the sun uh, with uh, the seasons and um, our time zones, our solar time and our time zones. All right, so let's talk the moon. The moon's orbit is actually almost circular. It's way more circular than it showed in this picture here. Um, but this picture illustrates that it does have a farthest point, and that's called apogee, and a closest point to the Earth, that's called uh, perigee. And, um, you know, the uh, picture here, of course, shows a very elliptical orbit. It's actually almost circular. Uh, it's just barely elliptical, um, so this is a little bit misleading. Uh, but the average distance is about 384,000 uh, kilometers. Uh, any satellite that orbits a planet is has the name apogee or perigee if it has any kind of elliptical orbit. So it could be a moon or, or any kind of natural satellite or um, artificial satellite. That's what they call those, those uh, orbits. And it's of also note that the moon actually uh, orbits on a plane that's tilted at five degrees. So the moon swings around the earth like this. It swings low and then it comes around and swings high and then swings low and high. So it, its shadow only touches the earth um, on unique times uh, in its orbit only about six or seven times a year uh, because of this five degree tilt. Um, 
So that's why we don't see an eclipse every month. If the moon was in the same plane right here with the Earth's orbit, it would be um, a different story. We'd have eclipses each month. Uh, one of the three main things about the moon is tides. And the tides are about gravity. Uh, water is pulled up towards the moon because of the moon's gravity. And so you can see like the moon picture down here. Um, as the moon orbits in this part of the Earth, it's pulling up on the water on this side. And actually because of the, the physics of, of gravity, uh, it actually bulges on the other side as well. So as the water is pulled up um, towards the moon on both sides of the Earth, you, you get high tide twice a, twice a day. Uh, the sun actually also causes tides. There's a solar tide and a lunar tide. So uh, there are times when the moon and the sun actually pull on the earth in the same directions. Uh, that's called spring tide. So you can see here, spring tide is where the moon pulls one way and the sun pulls the other. They can also pull in the same direction to amplify the tides. So the highest of the tides, or the strongest of the tides, those are the spring tides. And also then the moon uh, can be on uh, perpendicular direction from the earth and the sun. And that actually is the weakest of the tides. Those are called neap tides where the moon pulls one way, the sun pulls the other, and they kind of cancel each other, other out a little bit. That's the weakest of the tides, neap tide. Now, the lunar tide is much stronger than the solar tide because the moon is so much closer to us. So um, the moon's uh, tides, the, the tides that are caused by the moon are much stronger, right? Uh, but nonetheless, both of them have an effect. So tides are about gravity. Um, here's a couple of fun facts before we move on about tides uh, that are not listed here. Um, the, er the, uh, the Earth actually has air tides and land tides also. It's not just the water that gets pulled up towards the moon, but also the land surface. So um, it's not like, uh, like, here comes the moon, whoa, like a, you know, like a... Um, like a wave at a state, a football stadium or something. It's more like, um, it's more like the entire surface of uh, the hemisphere is pulled up towards the moon. So we don't really kind of feel it right as the moon goes by, but the, the land goes through tides. Um, the air also goes through tides as well. The atmosphere gets pulled up towards the moon and then relaxed back down as the moon uh, passes. So, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we have and land and air tides. Also, the moon, because of these tidal forces, actually keeps the same face towards the earth at all times. This is called tidal lock. And so we we've only seen, most humans have only seen one side of the moon, because when you look up at it, you're seeing the same side. It keeps the same face towards us, and this is a gravitational effect. It's called tidal lock. Uh, one last point about the moon is that as it pulls on the surface of the earth and kind of rises it up and squishes on the earth, it actually frictionally heats the interior of the earth. So tides uh, and the tidal forces pulling on a planet can actually heat up the planet inside. Uh, and it also heats up the moon a little bit. The moon actually has a little bit of heating because of the tidal pull the earth has on it. Um, we've seen some moons out there in the solar system uh, Jupiter's moon Io, for example, is so frictionally heated by Jupiter's uh, tidal forces that it's it's constantly volcanic. Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system, and that's because it is stretched out and relaxed and stretched out and relaxed by the gravity's gravity tug of Jupiter thanks to tides. So those are some fun facts about tides. The phases of the moon uh, are about viewing angles, all right? Uh, the phases of the moon are about viewing angles. Different phases occur because the sun, earth, moon lineup has the moon in different positions being lit up, uh, and we can see the lit up side at different angles. Um, so a little bit about this, the moon takes a little more than seven days to travel, travel one quarter away around the earth. So if you take a look at the, this diagram here, we've got, uh, the earth right here, and these are, this is the moon at different positions around the earth. It takes about seven days for the moon to go from here and go all the way over to here a little bit over seven days. And then another seven days to go, a little bit more than seven days to go from here to here, a little bit more than seven days to go from here to here. And it takes one quarter trip around about a little bit more than each, uh, seven days. That makes, that means it lines back up with the sun uh, 
as we orbit the sun, uh, it takes a little, has to go a little bit more than 360 degrees to line back up, but it lines up about every 29.5 days. So the lunar month, the time it takes for the moon to get completely around the earth and line back up with the sun is about 29 and a half days. In fact, the Romans used to use that as their calendar, the lunar calendar. Uh, the calendar was adjusted in uh, the, I think it was the 1500s by uh, Pope Greg, Pope Gregory, uh, and it's called the Gregorian calendar, the one that we follow today, actually. Um, so we have different phases because the angle you're viewing the lit up side of the moon. So when you look at this diagram here, you can see the, the earth lit up in a pretty uh, aqua color here. And that's because the sun's light over here is shining in on the earth. The other side here of the earth then would be like midnight. It'd be dark over here on this side of the earth for those folks. And the, the earth is kind of like um, uh, spinning around, rotating around here like this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and use the stylus to help say. So here's the earth's rotation as it, as it moves. That's its rotational direction. And the moon actually moves this way in its orbit around the Earth, okay, like so. And so this part of the Earth is lit up and this part is dark, all right? Likewise, when you look at the moon here, this is the moon uh, when it's lined up with the Earth and the sun here. And um, what we do, what we see when we look up at the moon is all darkness. We actually don't see any of the lit up side. And so what this shows, these, these ones here, these uh, positions here, they show what the, what the moon would actually look like if it, were, it were, if it were at each of these positions here. So this is just like a view. Um, this one is like what the moon is in space here. And this is what it looks like, uh, what it would look like from Earth. All right. Uh, so... Again, when we look up at the moon, if we're standing here, okay, looking up at the moon, all we see is dark, so we don't see any of the moon. This is what we see from Earth, and so this phase is called new moon, when the moon lines up with the Earth and the sun here. So this position here would be new moon, okay? That's how that works. So our angle of viewing of the moon has us not viewing any of the moon. If we take a look over here now, at this phase, uh, when we when we look up at the moon, what we're going to see is, if you can imagine um, looking up, and I'll go ahead and try this again. If we uh, look up at the moon, what we're going to see here is we're going to see all lit up side on our right side. Uh, and again, if you're standing here on Earth, this would be your right side and this would be your left hand. Okay, as viewing the moon, the right side is lit up and the left side is dark. I'm sorry, switch that around. Sorry, let's try that again. If you're standing here on the earth and you're looking up at the moon, all right, yeah, I was right. Your right side is lit up and your left side is dark. Okay, right side lit up, left side dark. And so we see down here, this is what we see. The right side is lit up and the left side is dark, and this is what we call a first quarter moon, okay? Uh, and so that's how it is. The viewing angle of the lit up side for us makes the lit up side right and the, the, the left side dark. So that's first quarter. It's one qu The moon is one quarter of the way around the uh, Earth, so that's why they call that first quarter. Uh, when the moon is here now, if you look up, if you're standing here looking up at the moon, we, we see all lit up side from the earth, okay? And so that one is what we see from earth. That's called full moon. And then, of course, last quarter when we're standing here looking up at the moon, our uh, right side is dark and our left side is lit up. So right side dark, left side lit up. Okay, that's a last quarter moon. Or they all sometimes call it third quarter because it's three quarters of the way around the earth here. Okay, and then finally, uh, it comes back to new moon. Now, um, let's if you take a look at one like this, an angle like this, where we're we're viewing the moon here, when standing on the Earth, looking up at the moon here, with our uh, right in our right side and our left side. Note that there's just a little sliver of light on the right, and there's a lot of dark on the left. Little sliver of light on the right, and a lot of dark on the left. That is a waxing crescent moon. Okay, that and that. Okay, so a crescent moon is 
uh, looks like a crescent. Okay. And the same thing happens on the other side with the waning crescent. It looks similar. Waxing means kind of getting brighter and waning means kind of uh, getting, getting dimmer. All right. And likewise, when you look over here at this position and you're standing here on earth, okay, and uh, your right hand is here and your left hand is here, we see a little sliver of dark on the left and all the rest is lit up. So here's our left side little sliver uh, dark on the left and the, the right side is mostly lit up. This is our waxing gibbous phase. So you get your new moon, your full moon, okay? We've got our quarter moons here, our uh, first quarter and third quarter. And then we've got our, our crescent moons, which are the crescent shape, either waxing getting bigger or waning getting smaller. And finally, you've got your uh, gibbous moons, and a gibbous moon is, is mostly full. It's like between uh, half and full. And so you've got the waxing variety where it's getting brighter and the waning variety where it's getting darker. And these are our phases. And again, phases are about viewing angles, okay? All right, any questions on that? Lastly, eclipses are about shadows. So where phases are about the viewing angle, sometimes people get confused and think, oh yeah, the phases are because the earth passes through the uh, shadow of the moon. And that's, that's actually eclipses. The phases are about viewing angles. Eclipses are about shadows. Um, so the best way to start talking about uh, eclipses is to talk, start talking with the solar eclipse. Uh, what happens when the sun's light comes in towards uh, earth and the moon is there, the moon actually casts a shadow behind it, uh, and when uh, it actually, the moon is kind of traversing this way in its orbit around the Earth, when the moon kind of starts to pass, it, it lines up so it perfectly passes in front of the Earth in the same plane as the Earth's orbit at... Uh, new moon, uh, its shadow, actually the tip of the earth, the moon's shadow touches the earth's surface there. And that's called a total solar eclipse. Uh, when those people in that so-called path of totality, and that's where the, it's a, it's a small area, actually only a small area on earth actually gets to see the full total solar eclipse where the sun is completely blocked out. It's that little area there called the path of totality. Uh, but that small area there sees a total solar eclipse. Now, uh, the shadow of the moon actually isn't just this this shadow. We all know that we all saw a partial solar eclipse several years ago when uh, the moon came through and eclipsed in 2017, right? Um, what happens is, is the moon actually casts a lighter shadow out this way. So um, this diagram shows, shows how this works. The sun's rays are coming in um, at all angles, right, toward the earth this way. And when it does it, it actually casts a, a very dark part of the shadow called the umbra, but it actually also casts this lighter shadow called the penumbra. And the lighter part of the shadow uh, is where if the earth passes through that lighter part of the shadow, it um, receives a partial solar eclipse. So all the rest of the earth, these, these folks here, these lucky folks are seeing the path of totality. This is uh, that's that's where you see the total solar eclipse. All the rest of the folks on Earth are seeing a partial solar eclipse where they are in the moon's penumbral shadow. So remember, the penumbra is a lighter part of the shadow. All right. Now, there's one more situation. Um, sometimes you'll get a, a, a situation where the moon might be a little bit further away from the Earth here. And I'll try to uh, sketch that in here. If the moon, say, is right here, it's a little bit further away. From, that's kind of make it confusing. Never mind. If the earth is actually like, instead of the, having the earth be right here where the moon's shadow actually touches the tip of the earth, okay, what we're going to do is uh, sometimes the moon's shadow doesn't make it. When the moon is near its um, apogee, its shadow does not touch the earth here. The tip of the moon's shadow can't reach because the moon is, is too far away from the earth. And so the folks here in the, in the, in the, what would be the path of totality, they don't see uh, a total solar eclipse. They call it, see what we call an annular solar eclipse. It's like the moon is trying to cover the sun, but it doesn't quite make it. And so they see this dark part of the moon here in the center with a bright part 
or a little ring, a little bright ring of the sun peeking out around all the edges. That's called an annular solar eclipse, okay, where the tip of the moon shadow can't reach the, can't reach the Earth, okay? Uh, so eclipses, and, and so when solar is eclipsed from our view, when the sun is eclipsed from our view, uh, solar eclipses occur in such ways uh, because the, uh, the moon's shadow is hitting the Earth. Very much like that, uh, lunar eclipses happen, and that is because Luna is eclipsed from our view, and the moon passes through the Earth's shadow, like so. Uh, so Earth casts its uh, umbra back into space behind it. Uh, Earth's umbra is much bigger than the moon, so it's it's much more likely you're going to see a total sol a total lunar eclipse, and that's when the entire moon is eclipsed from our view. Uh, but you also get these partial lunar eclipses where, you know, the moon um, happens to be a little bit above the Earth because, remember, it, it orbits five degrees off of, off of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So the moon is swinging high and low most of the time. Uh, so the Earth also does cast a an, an, uh, penumbral shadow. Okay, penumbral shadow, and as a result, this penumbral shadow, the moon can pass through that and then experience a partial lunar eclipse. Okay, so the bottom line here is that eclipses are about shadows. When solar is eclipsed from our view, uh, we're in the path of the moon shadow, and when Luna, Luna is eclipsed from our view, we don't see the moon anymore. It's passing through the Earth's shadow. So eclipses are about shadows. Phases are about viewing angles, and tides are about gravity, all right? And that is the motions of the moon. So the course of motions of the stars rising in the east and setting in the west, uh, the motions of the earth, of course, cause those motions in the sky, which is the rotation and the revolution. Thanks to the revolution, we can see all the stars over the course of the year. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, the motions of the sun cause us in our sky cause seasons and our solar time. And as a consequence of that, we have to make time zones. And the moon creates tides, which are about gravity, phases, which are about viewing angles, and eclipses, which are about shadows. So thanks for listening to our bit about motions in the sky.